Now, everybody enjoys a horror story and this one is called The Phantom Coach by Emily Edwards. I hope you will like it. You can just play it in the background, listen to it and practice your listening comprehension if you are interested in improving that. It's a very interesting story and before we start remember to subscribe to our channel hit the like button and make sure you have the notification button on so you can find out when we release new videos okay without further ado let's go the events I'm going to tell you about are true they happened to me 20 years ago but I remember them as if they happened only yesterday during those 20 years I have told only one person about them and now I find it difficult to overcome certain reluctance. You see, I don't want you to force your conclusions on me. I believe in the evidence of my own senses and I won't change my mind. One December day 20 years ago, I went out hunting with my gun, but I had no luck all day. The east wind was cold on that wide empty moor. A moor is a big field, big space, lots of green. In the north of England, it wasn't a pleasant place in which to lose your way and I had lost my way. A snowstorm was coming and the evening sky was getting dark. I looked anxiously into the distance but I couldn't see any signs of habitation. No fences, no cultivated land. So I walked on hoping to find shelter somewhere, a place where you can find safety. I'd been out since dawn and I was very tired. While I was walking, the snow began to fall. It grew colder and colder and then the night came down rapidly. My heart grew heavy as I thought of my young wife watching for me through the window of that little inn. We'd been married only four months and we were staying in a remote village called Dolding on the edge of the English moors. We were very much in love and very happy. That morning I left my wife and I promised to return before sunset. If only I had kept that promise. But even now I thought if I could find shelter and a guide I might get back to my wife before midnight. The snow continued to fall and the night got darker. I stopped and shouted now and then but that seems to make silence deeper. I got frightened when I remembered stories of travelers who had fallen asleep in the snow and died. Could I walk all night in the snow? Death! I trembled, thinking how hard it would be for my darling wife if I died. No, no, I couldn't stand the thought of it, so I shouted louder and longer. And then I listened. Did I hear something? Was there an answer to my shouts? Suddenly, I saw a speck of light, a little bit of light, in the darkness and I ran fast towards it. Then to my great joy I found myself face to face with an old man carrying a lantern. Thank God, I exclaimed. What for? growled the old man lifting the lantern and looking into my face. Well for you, I got lost in the snow. People get lost around here now and then, so why shouldn't you? the old man said rudely. Maybe you're right, my friend, but I don't want to be lost without you. How far am I from Dolding? 20 miles, more or less. And the nearest village? That's 12 miles away. Where do you live then? Over that way. Are you going home? Maybe. Then I'm going with you. But the old man shook his head. It's no good. He won't let you in. Not him. And who's him? The master. Who's the master? Mind your own business, was the rude reply. All right, friend, I said. You lead the way and I'll follow. I'm sure the master will give me food and shelter tonight. Well, you can only try, muttered my guide and shaking his head, he went off through the snow. Soon I saw a large shape of a house in the darkness. Is this the house? I asked. This is it, said the man, putting a key in the door which was like the door of a prison. 
I stood close behind him, ready to enter immediately, and as soon as he turned the key, I pushed past him into the house. I found myself in a great hall with rafters, thin long pieces of wooden metal beams. On the ceiling, hams and dried herbs hung from them. On the floor, there were sacks of flowers and agricultural tools. To my surprise, there was a large telescope on four wheels in the center of the hall. While I was examining it, a bell rang. That's for you, said my guide. His room is over there. I went and I knocked at a small black door at one end of the hall. Receiving no answer, I entered without permission and saw a huge old man with white hair standing at a table covered with books and papers. Who are you? Who are you? He said. How did you come here? What do you want? James Murray, on foot across the moor, meet, drink and sleep. The man frowned. This is not a hotel. What right have you to force yourself on me? The right of self-preservation. Outside, I would be dead in the snow before dawn. Indicating a seat for me, my host sat down at the table and began to study his books again. The man looked out of the window. Hmm, that's true, I suppose. Well, you can stay here until morning. Then turning to my guide, he said, Jacob, serve the dinner. Indicating a seat for me, my host sat down at the table and began to study his books again. I sat near the fire and looked around the room with curiosity. The floor was covered with maps, papers and books. There were cupboards full of geological objects, bottles, bottles of chemicals and other pieces of equipment. A model of the solar system and a microscope stood on a shelf beside me. I stared at my strange surroundings in amazement. Then I turned my head to the master. He had a fine head covered with thick white hair and an expression of deep concentration. He looked like Beethoven, the composer. Suddenly the door opened and Jacob brought in the dinner and the master invited me to eat at the table. We ate in silence. When we'd finished, Jacob took the dishes away and took my chair back to the fire. To my surprise, the master came and sat with me. He told me that he had lived here alone for 23 years and I was the first stranger he had seen for four years. Then he began to tell me about his wife. He'd been a student of the supernatural in his youth and had studied hard, learning everything the old philosopher said about spirits, ghosts and spectres. But modern science doesn't accept the supernatural, he continued. And because I studied these marvels of the spirit world, the scientist said I was crazy. The scientist and philosopher had laughed at him and destroyed his work and his reputation. So he had come to live in this remote part of England. He'd forgotten the world and the world had forgotten him. It was a sad story. When he had finished speaking, he went to the window. It has stopped snowing, he said. I jumped quickly to my feet, ready to go. But then I said in despair, No, it's impossible for me to walk 20 miles across the moor. Oh, I will never see my darling wife tonight. Your wife? Where is she? At Dwolding. Oh, I'd give a thousand pounds now for a horse and a guide. The master smiled at this. You can get to Dwolding for much less than a thousand pounds. The night mail coach from the north goes to Dwolding. It passes a certain crossroads only five miles from here in about an hour and a quarter. Jacob can guide you there. And he rang the bell and gave old Jacob his directions. Then he offered me a glass of whiskey, which I drank. It was very strong. It will keep out the cold, said the master. Now you must go. Good night. I thanked him for his kind hospitality and in a minute Jacob and I were out on the white silent moor. It was freezing cold, no stars shone in the black sky. The only sound was the crunching of the snow under our feet. Jacob walked in front of me and I followed with my gun on my shoulder. I was thinking of the old master, but his voice and his words still rang in my ears. 
What he had said about the supernatural excited my imagination. Then Jacob's voice broke into my thoughts. Follow this stone wall on your right and you can't miss the crossroads. How far is it? About three miles. The road is steep and narrow, so be careful, especially near the signpost where the stone wall is broken. It hasn't been repaired since the accident. What accident? About nine years ago, the night mail coach crashed through the wall near the signpost and fell into the valley. There were four passengers inside and all of them were killed. The coachman, the guard and an outside passenger died too. How horrible. Near the signpost, you say? I'll remember. I gave Jacob some money and he went into the darkness. Then I began to walk along the road, keeping the stone wall to my right. How silent and lonely it was. I felt so lonely, I started to sing a tune. The night air became colder and colder. My feet were like ice. I walked faster to keep warm and I tried to occupy my mind so that I wouldn't think about the master's talk of the supernatural. After a while, I had to stop and rest. As I leaned against a stone wall to get my breath back, I saw a point of light in the distance. At first, I thought it was Jacob coming back, but then I saw a second light exactly like the first light and I guessed that a vehicle was approaching. I was surprised. What was a vehicle doing on this steep, dangerous road? But there could be no doubt that it was a carriage coming fast and silently towards me through the thick snow. Was it possible that I had passed a crossroads in the dark and this was the night mail coach I had come to meet? I didn't have time to answer before the coach came round the bend of the road at full speed. I waved my hat and shouted but the vehicle passed me. Then to my relief the driver stopped and I ran to the coach. The guard seemed to be asleep because he didn't answer my greetings and he didn't move. The passenger sitting next to the coachman didn't even turn his head. I opened the door and looked in. There were three people inside. I got in and sat in a corner, feeling very glad about my good luck. Inside the coach it seemed, if possible, even colder than outside and there was a damp and unpleasant smell. I looked at the other travellers, all men. They were silent but didn't seem to be asleep. Each man was sitting back in his corner and seemed to be lost in thought. I tried to start a conversation. It is very cold tonight. I said to the passenger opposite me. He lifted his head, looked at me, but didn't reply. This is real winter weather, I added. Although I couldn't see his face clearly, I saw that his eyes were looking at me. But he didn't say a word. I was beginning to feel ill. The icy coldness had penetrated to my bones and the strange smell in the coach was making me feel nauseous. Turning to the traveller on my left, I asked, do you mind if I open the window? He neither spoke nor moved. I asked and when he didn't answer, I pulled the leather strap impatiently to open the window. The strap broke in my hand. It was then I noticed the thick mildew on the window. Years of accumulated mildew. Mildew is like fungus. It's white and you find it in old buildings. Now I turned my attention to the condition of the coach. Every part of it was falling to pieces. The whole machine was mouldy, like rotting, covered with fungus. The wood was rotting, the floor was nearly breaking away under my feet. I said to the third passenger, this coach is in a terrible condition. It's rotting away. I suppose the regular coach is under repair, is it? He moved his head slowly and looked at me without saying a word. I will never forget that look as long as I live. It froze my heart and it freezes my heart now when I remember it. His eyes glowed in a natural way. His face was as purple as a corpse and his lips were pulled back as if in agony of death, showing his bright teeth. An awful horror came over me. I looked at my opposite neighbour. He was looking at me too with the same red glow in his eyes. I turned to the passenger next to me and saw, oh God, how can I describe it? I saw that he was dead. All of them were. 
the pale phosphorescent light of putrefaction played on their faces and their hair, which was damp with the dampness of the grave. Their rotting clothes were dirty with mud, and their hands were the hands of long dead corpses. Only their terrible eyes were living, and those eyes were looking at me menacingly. With a scream of terror, I threw myself at the door and tried to open it. At that moment, I saw the moon shining on the signpost, the broken wall and the black valley below. Then the coach rocked and fell like a ship at sea. There was a tremendous crash and a terrifying sense of falling. For a moment, I felt a great pain, then darkness. It seems years later that I woke up one morning from a deep sleep and I found my wife sitting by my bed. She told me I had fallen over a precipice near the crossroads and I had only survived death by landing in deep snow. Some men had found me at dawn, carried me to safety and called the doctor. When the doctor came, I was in a state of delirium and had a broken arm. My name and address were on some letters in my pocket, so the doctor was able to contact my wife, who came and nursed me with loving care until I was out of danger. The place where I fell was, of course, exactly where the nightmare coach had crashed nine years before. I have never told my wife about the terrible events of that night. I told the doctor, but he thought it was all a dream caused by the fever in my brain. Well, others can form any conclusions they want. I know that 20 years ago, I was the fourth passenger inside the Phantom Coach. Well, I really hope you like this story. And if you know of any other story that is worth talking about, do write a comment, hit that like button, and remember to subscribe to our channel. Every Monday we try to bring you one video, one podcast, and there are at least six or seven other videos on my Instagram and TikTok channel. So watch out for those. Take care, have a great one. Bye for now. Peace.